So Lynn and I went to Cam and Elisa's wedding on Friday night. Cam, who's, who was working here with us for the last couple of years in our youth group. And as we tried to clear up last week, there's been this confusion for quite a while that uh, Cam, every time we see Ashley in the room, because we knew Ashley's getting married, that somehow they were getting married to each other. And so I, I, I sat there on Friday night, and even though I knew that you guys weren't getting married, I just was waiting just to make sure that I wasn't wrong and confused. And uh, so he did marry Elise. And so next up in September is Josh and Ashley. And uh, it was a lovely wedding this past week, but it's going to be an even lovelier one coming in a few weeks, and we look forward to that. God is good. It was a beautiful, beautiful evening, and set, set out in the mountains up in Cleveland, Georgia, and uh, we had an, uh, di different uh, animals out in the background, and it was just, the uh, sun was setting. It was a beautiful night, and uh, so we were there representing for you. I sat in the back because, well, you know, I don't get to sit in the back like a lot of you do, and I just was wondering what I was missing. And uh, it, it, I found out that when you sit in the back, you miss a lot because I couldn't see them, I couldn't hear them. It was uh, like, w what's this all about? So if you're sitting back there, I, you, maybe you just don't want to say you're here. And if you're always welcome to come up a little closer, if you'd like, we would. Uh, so, so years ago, we, we, it, we had uh, the, the first service had really gotten down. It was, it was like the old Atlanta Braves games used to be, and uh, the, it was just kind of really empty, and I would say, please come up front, please come up front, and everybody's back there, no, no, we're not going to do that. So I took the podium, and I went down there, and I started right there, and each week I would move a little bit further, and people would, <laughs> people would move back a little bit farther and move back a little bit farther, and I was about a third of the way up at that point to get everybody and um, it was quite interested, so interesting. So uh, just don't test me. I'll do it again if I have to. <laughs> so we, we hear the New Testament reading this morning, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And, it, and we hear, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and began, he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sent, sitting at the tax collector's booth, Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating there with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Friends, these are God's good words, and may he add his blessings upon them. So I'm going to start with a quote this morning, and, and, and we may go back to it a few times during the, the sermon. It's one that bears repeating over and over again. So if you hear me repeat it in the sermon, I know that I repeated it already. You know, we get to a certain point, we start repeating things and don't know it. I know that I might be repeating this this morning. And the quote goes, Grace never seems fair until you need a little. Grace never seems fair until you need a little bit. My observation of the human condition, and I, I, I like to think of myself as a curious person and a person who likes to sit and observe. When we got married, we, we didn't have enough money to go out much for much more than a scoop of ice cream every once in a while. And we would go into uh, the, the mall there in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we would sit on the bench and get a, a scoop of ice cream, and we would just observe and watch people walk by, and that was our entertainment for for several years on a Friday or a Saturday night, and we would try to guess what people did for a living, and you know, people would, would walk by, and we'd go, well, that, that one certainly is a brain surgeon right there, and then we'd go, that one certainly needs a brain surgeon right there. <laughs> and, and so it was kind of fun to just sit and watch, but I, I observed not only the things of people outwardly, but inwardly, and attitudes, and, and just thoughts, and, and the views that people have on the world, and one of the things, and, and I am included in this group, is that it's easy for us to, to recognize how unfair life can be when, when grace is extended to others, but also how much we expect it and want it 
when we somehow have messed up. I want to just kind of say that again so we make sure we get that. It, sometimes we look at others and, and someone, they, they mess up and they get some grace and they get off the hook and we think, well, that's not fair. They needed to be punished. And then we do something very similar and we think, oh, I, I sure hope, you know, I'm a really good person and I hope that they'll give me a break. I hope that I'll, I'll, I'll get off the hook. Maybe we see somebody run a stop sign or, or they're tailgating us or driving erratically. And, and what is our, our first thought? Where is a policeman when you need one? We need somebody to get up behind that car, pull them over, drag them out, arrest them, get it on YouTube, and so that we can see uh, that how horrible those people are. And then we drive along, and maybe we're going seven, eight, ten miles over the speed limit, which seems fair because everybody's doing it. And, and the policeman pulls us over, and our first thought, why is he picking on me? Maybe he'll give me a break. I don't deserve this. Everybody's doing these things, and I need, I need someone to give me some grace. Everybody does what I'm doing. What I'm doing is not that bad. When we see someone and, and, and we find out that something from their past has been revealed on news or internet or some of those things, sometimes we, we think, boy, I hope they really come down with the book, hit them with the book, hit them with the hammer, that, that they just really get what they deserve. And yet if all of us were honest, maybe not something we've done, but something we thought, if all of a sudden everything that was in our life was revealed publicly, we would be going, oh, I, that, I hope people don't see that as me being that bad a person. I hope they give me a break. Remember, grace never seems fair until you need a little bit. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were constantly offended by Jesus, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Being that we are, we are a people of faith, uh, religious institutions and churches, but the people of Jesus' day, and I would share that even the people of our day were often falling the same kinds of, of dilemmas where we get offended when people get off the hook. There was a, a, a phrase that a, a great theologian from many years ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, used. It was cheap grace. Many people were talking about if grace was free and we didn't have to earn it and we got off the hook, it would, it's just cheap. It's not fair. Again, unless it's us and then we're thankful for it. But these religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were offended by, number one, Jesus' choice of friends. We see in this passage today that, that as people were looking at them, the religious people would say, these people are not religious enough. They're scoundrels. They're troublemakers. What is Jesus doing hanging around them? They're gonna get, he's going to get a bad name by hanging around them. And number two, they were offended by his willingness to forgive their sins so quickly he didn't make them walk around in sackcloth and ashes. He didn't make them pay money to have their sins forgiven. Later, there were churches that would, would use that as an opportunity, and because they, they, they felt the same way, they would actually say that you can, you can pay money to have your sins forgiven, and people who are in heaven that maybe didn't get forgiven quite good enough, you give enough, they'll be forgiven there. Just, we're gonna, we got a building project, so please give freely. But Jesus, over and over again, would see people who had been doing despicable, scoundrel, scoundrel things, and he would say, hey, come hang out with me. Follow me. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. You get a brand new start today. Ding, 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 that was easy. It wasn't easy because we know that Jesus had to die on the cross, so no grace is cheap when it comes from Jesus because what Jesus gave paid it all. It cost his life, his very life, the Son of God. We see this over and over again in the Scriptures. Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals a man of lep leprosy, a, a disease that was thought to be either because of something that he did or maybe his parents did, and he was the recipient being paid for paid 
because of what his parents had done. And, the, and the, 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 the Pharisees and the religious people, they were just angry because Jesus would heal this man when they thought he didn't deserve it. Beginning of chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, Jesus healed a paralyzed man who had been brought to him by his friends. And he said to him something interesting because he knew, the, he knew the attitudes of the people that were there, the religious leaders. He, he could have just healed him and said, hey, you're, you're healed. But rather, he, he said to him, your sins are forgiven. Kind of a curious response. But he wanted them to know that their attitudes and their thoughts were not the ones that God had in mind for them that he healed them, and he finally said, take up your mat and walk. Now, I'm not sure about you, but if someone came in here today and they were on a mat or if they were totally paralyzed and we, we knew that it was a real thing, and then all of a sudden they got up and, and, and we prayed for them and they got up and walked, wouldn't we be excited? Wouldn't we be thrilled, I would hope? But the people in Jesus' day, when they saw him heal someone, they were, they were outraged. They were offended. They, they thought that Jesus had committed blasphemy as if he thought he was God. You know what? He was God. He not only thought he was God, he, he was God. In their minds, they were saying what my kids would say when they didn't get, feel like they were getting treated equally when they were younger. One would do something and maybe had to face a punishment. The other one would do something similar later and they would get off the hook. And what would the other one say? That's not fair. I see some kids looking at some parents right now. That's not fair. How many people in our, in our families, we, a lot of us have the siblings or someone in the family that's a that's not fair person. Uh, my, my, my daughter is uh, very much a rules follower and the only exceptions there are when she feels like the rules are not fair to her, then it's okay to break a few now and then. Some of us know about that as well. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 says, Once again Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them as he walked along he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and people who were considered sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Again, interestingly enough, not necessarily the religious one because he challenged everything they believed about religion and rules and, and following everything step by step. Sometimes people tell me, they say, Brian, we find out I'm a pastor. They said, I'm not religious. I said, that's wonderful. We're going to get along great because I don't think I am that much either. God didn't call me to be a religious leader, he called me to be a pastor, a follower of Christ, to help people to be in a relationship with Jesus. Christianity is not a, a, a rule-following organization. It is a relationship between us and God, our Father. Father, we're his children. To have a loving, caring relationship with him and to rely on his grace and his care. While Jesus was with all of these people, the teachers of the law who were riding around taking notes all the time about the things he did wrong, they said to him, or they said, why does he eat with all these tax collectors and sinners? Over and over throughout the Gospels, there's this theme that goes, there are several themes that go throughout the Gospels, but one that I see over and over are the religious people saying, number one, that's not right. That's just not right. Jesus, that Jesus would eat with all these sinners. He should stay away from sinners. Remember when we were growing up, remember our parents said to us, be careful who you, who you hang around with. Don't hang around with people that are going to be a bad influence on you. 
And yet Jesus was hanging around with those people all the time. I don't know how always to, to pull that, that dilemma apart, that tension. We're not supposed to hang around with people that are dragging us down and deeper and deeper away from God, but we are supposed to be around people who are far from God and love them and care for them and be an influence on them. It's sometimes tough to know when, that, when to apply those different principles. But they, they thought that Jesus, all that he was doing over and over again, if you read with that, that, that sort of filter, he would say, that's, that's not right. Jesus is just, he's too loving, too kind, too forgiving, too grace-oriented. And then number two, it's not fair that Jesus isn't letting them know how horrible they are. We've seen those religious religions too, haven't we? We've seen those churches that sit around with those signs that go, you are going to hell, you're a terrible person, over and over and over again. And that, boy, that really warms our heart and makes us want to come find out what they're teaching, preaching, doesn't it? Jesus was not the one who would hang out a sign like that. But the Pharisees were, the religious leaders who, who saw more things in them than in themselves. Jesus was one, it, it, it is easy at times to try to find things that people are doing outwardly that we can see and verify are breaking the rules, that are sins, that are doing terrible things. And Jesus over and over again infuriated people because he was talking to them about their thoughts their attitudes, their hearts, all those things on the inside that we, we sometimes try to hide, Jesus saw through. He knew people. He knew how bad we can be on the inside and, and uh, how, how much we can judge other people, myself included. And Jesus what, what was constantly challenging the religious people of the day to look at their own hearts, to look at their own attitudes, and to check the things that in his eyes were more important than just the things that people were doing wrong outwardly. When they ask, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17, Jesus says to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. And if you were to flip a little bit further into the book of Romans, the letter of Romans from the Apostle Paul, he would add, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even us who feel like we've checked off all the rules and gone to all the places that we should do and done all the good things, Paul would remind us, it's not just the ones who look bad outwardly out in the world. It's also us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans chapter 6, verse, in chapter 6, he says, for the wages of sin, which we've all committed, for the wages of sin is death. We all deserve it. But the free gift of God, the free gift of God, the grace of God comes to us in Christ Jesus. And I think it's a big part of worship that we come in and we come remembering that we're here because we've realized we've fallen short of God's plans. We realize that we, we, maybe we didn't run a stop sign this week, but we ran through some barriers, barriers of having good attitudes and responses and love and kindness to others. These religious leaders, they had followed all the rules, or so they thought. They were so good at it, they observed some of the things that they were doing, and they added rules. Well, I'm so good, I'm, I do this, that, and the other. Hey, let's write that down. Let's make that a rule that people have to follow as well. And I've seen over the years that I can look at other people sometimes and I, and I judge them for doing something that I do pretty well. And then I, I just sort of dismiss the things that I don't do very well. 
and I have an excuse for that. There's a phrase, the scandal of the gospel. And the Pharisees and religious leaders saw the gospel as a, a terribly scandalous thing that Jesus would love those people, that he would hang out with those people, that he would show kindness and mercy to those people, whoever those people might be. The woman caught in the adultery, John chapter 8, the religious people, they wanted to stone her. Jesus would forget, forgive her, back to the point saying, all right, the, those of you who have not yet sinned, you cast the first stone. And the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, one by one, they disappeared because they realized they too had fallen short of God's glory. The parable of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son who had taken his inheritance and run away and came back when he had lost it all. And he said, I'd, I'd rather come back and, and eat from the, the, from the pig slop, slop, all the things that, that and, 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 and just be in the presence of my father than to live out there in that world anymore. And when he came home, we know that the father in the story, the parable, he ran out to greet him, which again was a scandalous thing. Dads didn't do that. Uh, someone of his stature, the son needed to be punished. He's he not forgiven. And in this parable, Jesus said he was, he was welcomed and there was a party and there was someone who was missing. Remember who that was? It was his brother. His brother stood off in the distance and he said, that's not fair. You can't be forgiven, my brother. I've been the good son. I guess sometimes that's the thing, good thing about being an only child. I, I, I am one. I was both the best of my, 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 my mom and dad's kids and at times the worst of them, but I, I didn't have to worry about how good my brother or sister was and how unfair I was being treated. Jesus told in the story that the one who was the farthest away needed the most grace and love, and so the Father provided it. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they actually were very far from God. They were really good at religion, but they were really far from God. And although they sought to follow, to follow the rules, they were even unable to carry out all of those. And I thought this week, and I think often, if we're not careful, we might miss out on our need for God's grace because we're too focused on what someone else is not doing right. But the good news is also the good news that we should be willing and eager to share Jesus with other people around us. The good news is not just good news for us. It's good news for all who are in need, all who would follow, all who need grace and mercy. And when we realize we need it, boy, it makes it so much easier than to turn around and give it to someone else. Good news for us today. No matter what we've ever done or will ever do, Number one, Jesus is willing and able to love and forgive us. Some of us may need to hear that this morning. Still carrying this burden. There's a story, I can't remember all of it, but it was a story of, of someone who was, was carrying a, a metaphorical burden of sin and, and all sorts of things, and, and God came along and cut the bottom of the bag, and it kept getting lighter and lighter and lighter. God wants to take the burden that some of us have been holding on to and carrying for quite a while and say to you, it's forgiven. The bag's been emptied. You don't need to keep carrying it anymore. But not only is he w willing and able to forgive and love us, but number two, hopefully, 
we will allow him to love and forgive them, whoever they are. May God's grace be upon you today, not the burdens that so many of us would put upon you. And I have found that once, once I re received and realized the grace of God, boy, there's so much that I wanted to do to love him, to care for him. I've never wanted to take advantage of it. I've never wanted it to be cheap on my end because the depth of how much I understood it, just as Paul will say other, other, another place, he said, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. The next verse says, but we've been saved for good works. Too many times we get that backwards. This morning, I, I pray for us all that we might receive his grace, but we might also dispense his grace to those in need. Let us pray. God, sometimes grace just doesn't seem fair. Now, there are things that people still have to pay for and things they have to go through and in this world with society to be made right in society when they do wrong things, but if we come with a heart that's open, your grace is free in Christ. If we trust in Jesus, we find forgiveness and mercy and grace. God, it may be when we pull out of the parking lot today, get, get news of someone at work who got off of something that they should have been penalized. Lord, help us not to be the judge. Lord, I pray this morning that, that we might be reminded every day of the great depth of your love and grace for each of us. We sit here not because we deserve it. We've been good enough. We've learned enough. God, we sit here today because you've done it all. You've forgiven us. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. You would take your hymnal or you can follow the words on the screen. We're going to be singing number 597, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. Let's stand.
This morning we want to continue to pray for Dick and Sandy Taylor. They have gone from the hospital to a couple of different rehab centers. They've been split up at this point and are in need of our prayers. And Dick has had some brain bleeding and some other things. So pray for, for them and um, their, their family as well. Their daughter who's been looking after them and trying to keep in touch as she, um, one of them can contracted COVID and now I can't go see and check on them so it may be that she, it, it, she definitely needs our prayers. We want to uh, pray as if you if you hadn't spent um, much time on the news, listen to the news, is pray for the folks in Maui with those fires. Uh, around 90 or 100 now have, they've, they've discovered have, uh, have perished because of the fires but uh, the old historic town of Lahaina, that's uh, what a beautiful place it was. Uh, was burned down and so many houses and people's lives have just been destroyed and uh, so pray uh, pray for those people and uh, for for how long all the things it will take to get them back in their homes and businesses and rebuild also this morning uh, we don't have a, a long list of people in the hospital or that sort of thing but I know from talking to a lot of you and and knowing from uh, the way I, I see some of us when we stand or sit or walk that a lot of people in our congregation uh, deal with chronic pain. And, you know, we always pray for the emergency and the big thing, and, uh, but there, some of us, we kind of suffer quietly because of an ache to our ankle or maybe our knees or hips or, uh, forgive me if I've missed your joint, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's hurting. Uh, something in your back, something in your neck. Some of us maybe a little in our head. You know, we've got a little problem going on there. But really, the the things that we go on day and day, and and when you when you hurt, it makes it difficult to get up and do the things that God has for us to do, and to be thankful and pray for each other. We pray for you. Pray for all of you who are going through things uh, through doctors, and some that just you know, some of us we. We feel pretty free sharing the things that are going on in our lives. Others of us, we just don't. Here and at home, we don't know a lot of the things that people are going on, going through at home, and and just uh, the, that are facing uh, medical, long-term medical problems. We're going to pray pray for you as well this morning, even though it may be uh, you may be feeling like I need to go through this by myself. Know that God goes through it with you. And we need to pray for one another. Let's go before him now in prayer. God, we do pray for Dick and Sandy. We, uh, we thank you for the doctors and nurses, their kids that look after them, but they are in very bad shape and need, need your mercy very much so, Lord, so I pray for them and pray your will be done in their life. That you come, give them peace and, and comfort in these days. I thank you. We, we do celebrate with Cam and Elise and uh, their, their wedding on Friday. It was a beautiful wedding, a beautiful setting. It was Christ-centered and celebratory and God, we've got other, other weddings coming up in, in our congregation and in our families extended, and, and we just thank you for people that, that are still getting married and committing themselves to each other and to you. Thank you for those celebrating anniversaries and, and just able to, uh, to, to stay together and grow together through both good and bad times. Lord, we pray that continues. God, if we've watched any of the news this week and we saw the, the horrible sights in Maui, a place that is often uh, described as paradise or thought of as paradise for many who've been there or lived there, God, help us to remember that you are the ultimate place of our rest, our salvation, that, that in you we find paradise, that one day we'll be with you in heaven and it will be more wonderful than any place we imagine. But now we pray for those who are struggling and suffering and those who've lost loved ones because of this terrible fire. 
God, we, we also pray for those who suffer quietly with chronic illnesses that, that maybe get them up at the, in the night or keep them from enjoying the day that have placed them in what many of them would describe or many of us would describe as on the sidelines and or maybe from being able to, to do the things we want to do and those aches and pains throughout the day call out to us and distract us and sometimes grieve us. Help us to pray for one another, to be compassionate towards one another. We do not know what the person sitting beside us is often going through. Pray for those who are in treatment, going through different illnesses and God, it's a long journey, and I, and I pray for them that they might continue to have hope and feel your presence and love today and every day. Help them to know they're not forgotten. Help us to pray for them regularly. We come before you in a moment of quiet, and we give thanks for all the blessings that we have. Lord, we come. God, we pray for our leaders both here in the church and in our community and throughout the world. Being a leader is tough. Being a good leader is, is almost impossible with all that, the different dynamics and struggles that, that leaders face today. God, help us who are followers to be good followers, to be supportive and encouraging, prayerful, helpful help us to work together to build your kingdom here in this church help us to work together to make Ackworth a better place our schools our businesses help us to pray for our leaders in our country not that they would fail to, to show that we were right but rather they would succeed and the people would be helped and things would be better we seek your will each and every day. Help us to seek it this morning as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remember, we have our, our offering plates in the back. Please give as the Lord leads and generously. Uh, God loves a joyful giver, cheer, cheerful giver. And uh, we thank you for your support of this church and God's kingdom. And as you leave today, Continue to give your bodies over as a living sacrifice to God wherever you are. Worship Him in the way that you live and love and forgive. Uh, it'd be easy. It'd be easier if we just could drop something in the plate and our job was done. But it really is just beginning. So go in peace and may God bless you and keep you. Make His face to shine upon you. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be and abide with you all, both now and forevermore. God bless. You're dismissed, but all of you who would like to uh, stick around and learn some more about the Garden Project, uh, please come on up front. I, I won't, Charles may start coming back to you if, if you don't come up front.